get this on the client side is create some type of magical box or filter that can say, given some arbitrary piece of JavaScript code, I'll tell you whether it's bad or not. I, it would have to be on the, on the client side. And, uh, you know, so this is exactly the same problem as detecting malicious HTTP traffic. Because malicious JavaScript just looks exactly like regular JavaScript. Uh, first of all, it's going to request images. It's going to request script. It's going to make um, a mul to maybe multiple external domains. You know, I contact some ad server. You know, if I inject a little piece of script um, that, go co that goes and contacts evil.com, how is that any different than these, um, you know, news sites that have a little piece of JavaScript that goes talks to adserver.com to pull down some JavaScript, you know, underline some of the words and you hot, hot link over them or whatever. I mean, it, it looks like normal JavaScript. It does exactly what normal JavaScript does. It's going to hook on events, on mouse over, on submit, on click. It's going to modify and manipulate the DOM tree to access elements, create elements on the fly. I mean, this is exactly what regular JavaScript does. It's exactly what malicious JavaScript does. You're screwed. You can't figure it out. I could write a PhD thesis about how to do this, but I'm not in, <laughs> I'm not a doctorate student, so that's probably not going to happen. If someone wants to do that, they can. But this is a very, very hard problem. And this is also why layer 7 is very interesting, because it's full of hard problems like this. You've got to analyze what's coming back and try to figure out, is this good or is this bad? And everything we know about how to determine whether something is, is this good or is this bad involves signatures, involves all of these other things, and it simply doesn't work at layer 7. So if you're a computer science student right now, you really should consider going into web application security. And if you are, you should seriously come talk to me because I left college, went right into it. Well, no, I graduated from college. But I went right into it, and I am much happier working at layer 7 than any of the other layers because there are still a lot of very interesting computer science problems to solve here. So again, I don't want to harp on this, but you really think I'm selling fear by saying mm, cross-site scripting will destroy the internet. Well, consider a traditional information stealing Trojan. I install a keylogger versus I exploit a web app, or you know, let's say um, Gmail, and I install a keylogger there. All right, well, let's think about this. So wh what are the, the pros and cons? Actually, uh, I already have an example here. Uh, I infect a shared catalog on a web-based CRM, say like Sugar CRM or something fun like that. Any, user, any user who views an infected page gets their calendar infected, spreading the virus all along. So one page view causes the spreading. The payload is that I have a key log that then hooks, and because I can infect multiple pages on the uh, CRM, I can persist the key logger across the entire application. So I can now view all of the keys for all of your internal application. It's, it's not you leave the page and it's gone. I can persist it now because I can inject everywhere. Excuse me. So think about this. What, what's going to happen? I, I, I'm, in, I'm key logging everything that you ever enter into this application. Well, if I have a traditional key logger installed, uh, I'm going to find that using traditional techniques. I've got a virus scanner. Uh, I'm modifying some binaries. I've got something nasty running. Uh, there's, there's web malware detect, or there's, um, there's, you know, uh, what is it, ad aware. There are all these things to try to find malware that's doing nasty stuff. But think about a web-based attack, right? All your integrity check, all your integrity file or checks pass because I haven't even modified the binary. All the hooks, the, the operating system hooks for keyboard events and mouse events. I haven't modified your OS. I haven't injected your interop tables. So that all works. There are no cloaked processes. I'm not hiding anything nasty. Uh, the user's browser hasn't even been modified. The only thing I've done is spawned a little thing in RAM, and that's it. This works across all platforms, all PDAs, and there's no trace the virus even existed, except for occasionally when I send the keystrokes to some third-party site. I mean, you don't know it's there. As soon as you close the browser, it's gone. So let's start talking about real world stuff here, because I've got, what, a half hour? All right. So Perl.Santi. This was a conventional web application worm, pretty much hit in December 2004, most of the spring of 2005. It used Perl with LWP. Sometimes it used sockets. There were a couple variations of it to actually make requests to other web apps. Now remember, web application worms are the, the code that runs uses remote command execution to get into the web server, and then from the web server finds new hosts and goes and infects them. So the attack vector was I exploited this highlighting bug in PHPBB that would let me get code execution on the host. And then what I would do, as soon as the code ran, it would do a Google search, and it would say use a static string. It was something like search for powered by PHPBB like 2.4 or something like that. Use the static string to search Google for new hosts. And then it would uh, send requests to those, uh, to those hosts trying to infect them. 
the payload that ran once it actually found new hosts and spread was it just defaced all your HTML pages, things like that. Uh, now, there were some interesting downfalls to the Perl worm, or the Perl.Santi worm. The thing was is they, they asked Google to go find other hosts I can infect. And so Google basically could clamp the spread of the virus. If Google doesn't return any results if you search for this particular string, the virus is never going to get any new host to go and infect, and it's going to stop. And there was a static string inside the Perl, or in the Perl source code that said, send this string to Google. And so all Google said is, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it used an extremely poor host selection algorithm. It basically said, let me randomly generate a top level domain, uh, a country code like .co.uk, .co, you know, .ca, US, things like that. And also randomly pick some version of PHPVB that I know is vulnerable, fetch the page, and then go to like some random number between 1 and 10, and that's the host I'm going to infect. This was a really poor algorithm, and Perl.Santi kept trying to reinfect the same, you know, couple hundred results Google would return. So it didn't spread all that far. And so what Google did, still to this very day, if you do a, a search, a Google search for the, um, the static string that's in Perl.Santi, it comes back and says, a computer virus is sending us automated requests, and it appears you've been infected. We won't honor this request. So that's how they clamped it. There was no mutation of the source code. It was the same source code. You could write a signature for it. Uh, a, I'm going to talk about how you actually evade signatures. Uh, the search string, the attack string, they were all static. And the payload literally just defaced your site and gave props to nevermore no santi webworm. Oh, and it had this little generation. This one's generation 11, meaning this thing hopped through 11 islands before we got to this one. So it spread pretty far. But it, it was limited pretty much the first couple hundred or so hosts that were on Google. So the myspace.com virus. This thing's pretty cool. Uh, this is the web virus. Uh, basically, October of 2005. I know the MySpace guy's getting really sick of us talking about this, but uh, it's a very good proof of concept. It was a very interesting worm. Uh, it infected the fifth largest domain on the internet, which surprised me because I didn't realize it was that large. Um, it, it, it used JavaScript and Ajax. The attack vector was I injected some script into the user's profile. When you viewed my profile, Ajax then injected the virus into whoever was viewing it, their profile. Uh, we then added Sammy as their friend list and appended Sammy as my hero to their profile. And I seriously want a shirt that says Sammy is my hero because that, this was an interesting piece of work. I mean, no offense to the MySpace people, but, you know, because I know it did cost you guys lost some revenue because you had to shut the system down. And this was very interesting. And actually, this was very much a bell ringer because less than eight months later, we're going to start, well, we're going to talk next about the Yamaner worm, and we've gone to criminal enterprise. And this was really good. This really brought the security people to start going, whoa. You did what with JavaScript? Holy crap, you took down the fourth, fifth largest site on the internet with something that I'm just supposed to steal cookies and pop alert boxes? It really woke people up and realized that cross-site scripting is much more dangerous than we thought it was. So input filtering is very, very hard. And MySpace learned this the hard way. They do a really good job, in my props to MySpace, on filtering. They wouldn't let you use script. They wouldn't let you use the, the sequence of letters JavaScript, inner HTML, certain characters like double quote, things like that. But unfortunately, just blocking script wasn't good enough. What the attack actually did is created a div and said the style was this background, and that allows you to specify a URL. And then they used a JavaScript URI, which says JavaScript colon execute this code. And so as soon as this div tag would load, it would go, oh, there's a, there's a background here. Let me go grab that. Oh, it's JavaScript. Execute. And so it was instantaneous execution of the code. Um, also, Whitespace was their friend. They did tag inner dot, and then they broke inner HTML up so that, and they also used slash n inside JavaScript and different things like character, uh, string, char from code to dynamically build strings representing um, sequences of letters that MySpace normally filters. So they build them on the fly to get around the filters. There's also the eval statement, which also is in Perl too. Basically, you give the eval statement a, a string, and the string contains Java, or excuse me, JavaScript. So what the MySpace guys did is they had a div tag, and they had, this was kind of neat, they had expression equals alert. And the, they actually set basically an attribute that didn't normally exist on a div tag called expression. And that was their actual payload. Um, and then what they did is, in, because inside the, you'll notice my expression there is just alert with a double quote, and then uh, inside the alert are single quotes around XSS. Well, because the way he was executing JavaScript, it was style equals double quote, background, 
single tick, he already had a double quote and a single tick. So all this JavaScript that's inside, it wouldn't be able to have any quotes. So what he did is instead move the, the payload out of the background style, and he just said, you know, background is JavaScript colon eval, and then he said document.code, go grab the div element, specifically the expression attribute, and then execute that, which was really quite neat. It got around filters. It shows that it is very hard to filter web apps effectively. And um, you, you can go to this website and read a lot more about the technical challenges. Uh, it, it was a very, you know, again, I don't want to smack MySpace around because they did a good job filtering. This was just a very, very neat and interesting hack, and everyone should acknowledge that. So I talked about this this morning. The infection mechanism was really cool. Remember, we talked that Ajax is only allowed to talk back to the site it came from. So what happened is, is that um, you view profiles on MySpace on profiles.myspace.com. Well, the code to modify a profile doesn't actually exist on profiles.myspace.com. It exists on www.myspace.com. So what this virus did is you make a request to view, you know, Billy's profile on MySpace. The HTML comes down and it's got embedded JavaScript. And the only way I could really represent that was with that menacing skull and crossbones. So the very first thing the browser does is it goes, I need to somehow modify their profile. I can't do it at profile.myspace.com. However, www.myspace.com, not only can I edit profiles, I can also view profiles. So the very first thing the, browser, brow, the virus did is said, no, 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 go request this page we're at right now for Billy's profile, but request it from www.myspace.com and everything else. And so that's what the first red line is. It goes and it, it, it makes, your browser makes a request for www.myspace.com and the profile. The, the same, the same uh, HTML comes down with the embedded JavaScript. The first thing it does is uh, um, it makes a request saying, I want to update my profile. And uh, what happens is, is MySpace basically pushes down this one-time little hash. It's almost like, a, are you sure you want to do this? And it included in there, I believe, in a hidden HTML input uh, this little hash, and you had to click, yes, I'm really sure I want to do this, and it would send that hash and the new profile back to MySpace and actually change your profile. So the, the worm would then say, hey, update my profile. The response would come down. They used a regex to extract this hash and then make another Ajax request saying, here's the magical ticket you just gave me. Here's the payload. Yes, seriously, let's own this guy. The next thing it did is it had to add uh, Sammy to your list of friends. So I don't include that on this graph, but it also then made another request to make to invite Sammy, and then I believe when it infected your profile, it also added Sammy as my hero. This should scare the crap out of you, because you visited one page and JavaScript fired off five requests. Other than the very first request to switch domains to www.myspace.com, you didn't see any of them. Ajax is a double-edged sword. The same cool technology that means I can use Google Maps and have it be completely invisible and nice and smooth and I don't see all this stuff going on in the background means that when that stuff going on in the background is you getting owned, you don't know. And that's exactly what happened here. From your point of view, you're still looking at this profile. But in the background, you just made four requests, five requests. Now, the, the other cool thing I talked to, do I actually say it? No, I don't. Um, the other interesting thing about uh, Ajax that I talked about this morning, the server can't tell the difference between a, a HTTP request made by JavaScript using Ajax and an HTTP request made from the user clicking on a link or submitting a form. So the user's point of view is I viewed a, a profile, it came down and then I did a refresh but I'm still looking at the same profile, everything is okay. And in the back